Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing you how I made the space station generator for Blender 2.8. This tool was originally released on the 14th of November last year, following on from the mech generator tool. In the beginning I was split between building the space station generator functionality into the same script as the mech generator, but when drafting up different proposals, I came to the decision to do it as a separate script because it would be easier to manage and prototype different methods. Then I would always have the option to merge them together afterwards, perhaps in a new add-on or generation framework. I recorded my entire thought process in a development document. This is the first time I've done anything like this before. It's 19 pages and nearly 6,000 words, so I don't expect anyone to read it unless you're super interested in the process, but it should be interesting for you to see just how much time and effort goes into making these tools and videos. If you're interested in flicking through it, then I've included it in the paid version of the Space Station Generator package, and you can find it inside of the Extras folder. So just to briefly sum up what the Space Station Generator does in terms of functionality, it starts off by creating a virtual three-dimensional grid and populating a series of cells inside of that grid. And what these cells represent are the different modules of the Space Station. The algorithm developed to populate that grid creates a series of branches. And after all the necessary cells have been populated, we can use that data to tell Blender where to place objects in the scene. And when it comes to placing those objects, we cycle through all of the populated cells and we take a look at the neighboring cells to see if there's any other objects that should be placed nearby and this neighbouring data should tell us which modules need to be placed. For example, if there are populated cells to the left, right, forward and back of the current cell we're looking at, then we know that we need to place an X or cross-section module. And this is essentially how tile set systems work in video games. So let's take a look at the code. The beginning is just variables and class setup, which is nothing particularly important. The functionality really begins when we get down to line 101, after all of the necessary setup has been done, such as creating references to different collections. On line 101, you can see that we're calling the function generate cells. And what this does is what I just mentioned, which is it populates a three-dimensional grid. To see this, we'll have to scroll down to line 1087. Of course, if you're watching this video after a newer version of the tool has come out, then the code will look completely different and everything will be in different places. But let's take a look at what this function does. First of all, we do an immediate check to see if the maximum number of cells has been populated. This is of course to prevent Python from selecting an arbitrarily large number and causing Blender to crash. If it hasn't been reached, then we continue. Then we say if it's the start of the procedure, aka if it's the first branch in the population algorithm, then we create a vector at the world origin, which is 000. Then we append this vector to cell list. Cell list in this case is storage for all of the locations of all of the populated cells. So now that we know that our starting point for the first branch is 000 at the world origin, and it will always be this for every space station we generate. But to build a branch off of this, we need to know a few different things. First of all, we need to know the length of the branch, then we need to know the axis that we want the branch to grow from, and then we need to know the direction, whether or not to go in the positive direction or the negative direction of that axis. So if we look back at the code, we can see that we get the length of the branch in line 1114 with branch length equals random dot rand int branch min and branch max. Now these values can be modified in the JSON based config system which also comes with the paid version of the generator. Following on from this, you can see that we're randomly selecting the axis to grow from. This will be stored inside of the chosen axis variable. And then scrolling down here, you can see that we're also picking the random direction to grow from, which is only positive or negative, and this will be stored inside of the chosen direction variable. Once we have this data, we need to set the start procedure to false, which means that if we come back to this function, we're not going to take the same route through this code. But we'll come back to that in a minute. And now that we have the necessary data, we can now pass it on to another function called populate branch. And what this is going to do is actually start generating the cells along this branch. After we call this function, you can see that we're also going to be coming back to this function by calling generate cells again, but again, we'll come back to that in a minute. First of all, we're going to go and take a look inside of this populate branch function, but before we do, notice what variables we've been passing to it as an argument. We have current cell, which is the location of the active cell, or the star of the branch. We have branch length, which is how many cells we're going to grow from this, as well as the chosen axis and chosen direction of the axis. So to find this function, we just need to scroll up. We arrive at line 999, of course in this version of the generator, and again you can immediately see that we're checking to see if the maximum number of cells has been reached. In reality we don't need to put these checks in every single function, but I'm just being careful, especially as I'm prototyping different methods. With this while statement, we're basically looking at the length of the branch that we want to generate, as provided in the generate cells function. And what we're saying is everything that follows underneath this while statement, we want to do for the number of times as branch length. In generate cells, we already stored the origin cell, so now we need to generate the others. We'll start off by assigning a new cell the same value as the origin, which is current cell 0, 1, and 2 for x, y, and z respectively. But what we're going to do is increment or decrement a value on the chosen axis in the specified direction. 
As you can see here, if chosen axis is equivalent to X, Y, or Z respectively, and inside of these we have positive and negative, then it will respond appropriately. X, we will increment or decrement the zero index. Y is the one index, and Z is the two index of the vector. Move offset in this case is equivalent to the size of an individual cell. This can also be modified inside of the JSON-based config system, which comes in the paid version of the generator. But now we've got the position for our new cell, we're going to check for overlaps. First, I store the values in a new variable called new vector, and then we ask Python whether this vector already exists in cell list. If it doesn't, then we can continue. You might wonder why I've already stored the exact same data that exists in new cell in another variable, when I could just ask Python whether new cell already exists inside of the cell list. Well, these types of vectors are a bit strange, and they don't really like being reassigned or referenced in every situation. So whenever you see that I've strangely reconstructed the entire vector rather than referencing new cell directly, it's because Python was throwing errors that I couldn't immediately solve. Reconstructing the vectors on these lines fixed it, so when I come back around to clean up the code in a future version, I'll recondense these lines back into a more sensible format. So again, we know the data in new cell does not exist in cell list, so what we're going to do is we're going to append it to cell list ourselves. And now that we've added it to the list, we're going to make sure that current cell is now equivalent to the data inside of new cell. So we know that when calculating the location for the next cell, we're taking a step forward. Then what we want to do is start calculating the chance that a new branch is going to develop off of the new cell. To do this, we have if the branch chance is less than or equal to the chance level, then we do our selections and we get it to choose both an axis and a direction, but we're doing it slightly differently this time. When we get it to choose an axis, it adds all possible directions for that axis inside of a list. And if we scroll down, we can see what we're doing. We shuffle the list of possible axes and directions, then choose one to combine with the new cell's location data. We will take these two pieces of data and store them as a string, a bit like an instruction, and we're going to store them inside of a new list called branch list. So branch list is essentially a list of instructions that contains the starting points and the direction of where new branches should be generated. So now that we're done in the populate branch function, we're going to go back down to generate calls. And you can see that the next step on from this is to recall the generate calls function. So we re-enter it from the top, but this time, if you remember, we changed start procedure to false, so we're not going to be entering this amount of code, we're actually going to be coming down here. This time, instead of starting from the origin of the world, we're going to be taking a look at the instructions we stored in branch list, and we will use them to actually generate the cells for those branches. You can see here that if the length of branch list is greater than zero, then for every branch, if we still haven't hit the maximum number of cells, we will split up and read the instructions stored in the string, then choose a random length for the branch, and then we'll take this data and resend it to the populate branch function. Naturally, by calling the populate branch function, we will add new instructions to the branch list, and it's generally a bad idea to loop through a list when you're going to add new elements to it. So that's why for this loop, I've created a duplicate of branch list called branch ref. After this first set of instructions is completed, then we remove all of the elements from this first set and then recall generate cells. And because start procedure is still set to false, it will bring us right back to the same set of code. And what we'll essentially be doing is bouncing between generate cells and populate branch repeatedly. This will keep going until the end condition is met, where either there are no more branches that have been selected by the random procedure, or the maximum number of cells has been reached. Okay, so that's how the grid population algorithm works, but now the next logical step is how do we take that data and use it to get 3D objects into the scene. So now we're going to scroll all the way back up to line 101 where we started. So if you remember, this is where we initiated the call to populate the virtual grid. So now what we need to do is cycle through all of the cells that were created and stored in cell list and then perform neighbor checks on them to see if there's any modules that need to be placed next to them. This is where we need to stop and talk about the design of the system. For neighbor checks, we want to get a true or false value for every direction around the current cell. We need to do this so we know what kind of module to place in that cell to connect them all together. But just doing if statements for every possible combination of neighbors for every possible module type is ridiculously inefficient. So I came up with a system where we create a 6-bit binary type string that describes the surroundings of the cell. The first two bits represent the x-axis positive and negative, respectively. Then the middle two represent the y-axis, and then the last two represent the z-axis. By running comparisons on this string, it greatly reduces the amount of conditions we need to code for. But, with that being said, I still ended up running if conditions on all of them anyway. Which, yes, I know is not the most efficient way to write this system. And yes, I do know how to condense it into a more efficient version, but I do have a good reason as to why I've extrapolated the code this way. At the time of writing version 1 of this tool, I hadn't really decided on a way to implement modules that are larger than the size of an individual cell, and that's something that I would really like to add in a possible future version. But I knew from the beginning of writing the neighbor detection system that however I choose to implement larger modules, it will likely require a substantial rewriting of the entire system. But not only that, it will likely require the addition of conditional checks that are specific to the different types of modules. 
So while I'm experimenting with different techniques to achieve this, it's more convenient for me to stretch these checks out in a long but more easily readable way, rather than condensing the whole thing into a tiny but more efficient algorithm, where it will be harder to add conditions for new types of modules, keeping in mind that the whole system may very well require rewrites to support these new features. So with that being said, you can see how we check for all of the different neighbor combinations individually. Types like X modules are easy to check for, because it's just neighbors forming four points around a single axis, like forward, backward, and side to side. Then once we know this type of object can be placed here, then we look inside of the collection that contains the objects for that specific type of module. We then randomly select one of them, then copy the data over, then link it to the generation result collection. Then after this, we need to see if it needs to be rotated in any way, and we reuse the binary neighbor strings to help us with this. And here we can see another case of inefficiency, where I've included the case where the object doesn't actually need to be rotated. As you can see, there's no change to the value, but I've still reassigned the rotation variable. This is again because I've written the code in preparation for the testing of new features. For example, I've been thinking of ways to rotate modules that support extension branches, without breaking possible links to come back onto the station, but this will require a new type of algorithm to search down subsequent branches and make sure they don't link back. A call to an algorithm like this could potentially happen inside of this case, which is why it's been left there. If we take a look at the straight module section, you can see that something different is going on here. Right before releasing version 1 of this tool, I wanted to quickly add more variety to the look of the space stations. So I included support for extrusion details on straight pieces, so we could add things like small solar arrays that intrude into neighbouring cells. This would help make the details of the space station look a bit more interesting and realistic, but unfortunately this creates an issue, because straight pieces with extrusion details that are near a corner have the possibility for their details to intersect. I've included some code here to prevent the majority of cases where that would happen. To do this, I had to quickly code in some diagonal neighbouring checks. Ideally, in a future version of the tool with a condensed algorithm for this, diagonal neighbour checks will be done beforehand so that data is available to any type of module. To prevent these straight pieces from overlapping, we needed a way to tell the system which pieces have extrusion details. The way I did this was taken from the mech generator. If you remember, position reference objects in the mech generator have a prefix before their name, which is pos underscore. In this case, I told the system that anything with ext underscore in front of it would have extrusion details that intruded into neighbouring cells. So when it comes to placing a straight piece, if it knows it's by a corner, then it will avoid any of the objects that have ext underscore as the prefix. Anyway, that's the general rundown of how the code for the space station generator works. Most of this code will undergo heavy rewrites in future versions to make way for new features and optimizations, but I thought it might be interesting for you to see the code in version 1 before it's improved, as well as how I changed the way I prepare code to make way for new features. As we've already seen, a lot of the code in this space station generator is stretched out while I'm prototyping. But if you want to see some of my code that's more condensed where I'm not planning to do any more prototyping, then we need to swap over to the Biogen add-on. Here we're looking at the code for the first version of the Biogen interpreter, which is a way to output and input modifier stacks as a text format. But I design it in a way that should support any future modifiers as well, because it doesn't specifically look for individual variables. It said it takes a list of all the data paths that are associated with a modifier, ignores unnecessary data values, takes the remaining list, and then serializes that data. If I was to extrapolate things like the space station generator code, then I would have written conditions individually for each variable, but in this case I decided that wasn't necessary, so I condensed all of the potential thousands of lines of code into just a few dozen. Feel free to take a look inside of the Biogen code since it's open source and free to download. Anyway, if you want to download a copy of the space station generator, then the links to the free and the paid version can be found in the video description. And if you want to learn more about the differences between those two versions, then you can watch my original video on the tool. So well done for making it to the end of the video. Let me know if you did by typing something random like turtles down in the comments. If you found it interesting, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can also follow me on social media to keep up to date with content, and even join our Discord server to take part in discussions and share your work. So thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.